Good morning, Dr. Huma Johnson. Thank you for being with us today. So, you are a school psychologist? Yes, sir. And a doctor of clinical psychology. On top of it, you're known for raising black people's consciousness in the U.S., but also around the world. What steps have you been through to reach this level of consciousness? What steps have I been through? Well, my background is in the Garvey movement. Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, which is the organization that gave us the largest modern movement for black people and the red, black, and green flag. So I was Minister of Education at the Philadelphia Division of the UNIA. I was also first vice president there. So myself, like a lot of other black leaders, we all come out of the Garvey movement. Okay. Malcolm X's parents were both members of the Garvey movement. In fact, when Malcolm began, Muhammad Speaks newspaper that was influenced by Marcus Garvey's Negro World, Carlos Cooks and the African Nationalist Pioneer Movement, okay. Elijah Poole, who became the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, was a member of the Garvey Movement in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And we can go on and on. Yep. But myself, just like many other black leaders, I proudly say that I come out of the Garvey Movement. So that's where my foundation began. Uh, being a school psychologist is something that kind of occurred by accident. Mm -hmm. My track academically was purely uh, clinical psychology. Okay. I didn't know much about school psychology. All right. But it was something that was recommended to me during a conversation I had with the director of a graduate program okay. that given my background and my interests, I should look seriously at pursuing a career in school psychology, which I did. It's been almost 20 years, and it has been a tremendous experience. And being a school psychologist, I think my academic work was able to marry my political work okay. because through the school system, predominantly in the United States, and you see the same thing to a lesser extent in the UK and Paris and throughout Europe, uh -huh. the miseducation machine is the primary weapon that is used to disenfranchise black males and ultimately disenfranchise the entire black family. So in working as a school psychologist, I saw how special education and mental illness and psychiatric medication and disruptive behavior disorders was being used to fuel the school to prison pipeline. So there's a lot of Pan-Africanists whose academic work doesn't really fit smoothly into their political agenda. Okay. I was blessed to be in a career that fits squarely into the political agenda because education, political education, mm -hmm. a serious revolutionary Pan-African nationalist education is paramount towards the black liberation struggle. As a black leader, what do you think of the evolution of black people in the U.S. and worldwide? over the last 50 years? I think we have moved backwards, actually, really? outside of the continent. I would say on the continent, we have moved forward slightly. If I step outside of the continent and I look at the United States, you have a period where we came out of slavery in 1865. Mm -hmm. It's been 150 years since then. And so from 1865 till about 1965 was New Jim Crow, the Black Codes. Yep. Uh, the second class citizenship of African people. Now, with the work of the good Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Stokely Carmichael, H. Rap Brown, the Freedom Struggle, SNCC Corps, and all of those organizations and personalities that participated in the civil rights and black power struggle, we began to take a step forward. Okay. But with the FBI and CIA assassinations of Dr. King, Malcolm X, and uh, Fred Hampton, uh, and many other leaders, the black liberation struggle kind of took a standstill. And so after Dr. King's assassination in 68, yep. the government began to create a process whereby they could prevent from ever having to deal with a serious black push against white power ever again. Mm -hmm. So in 1970, what they did was they came into the inner cities of America, predominantly black communities, and they began to deindustrialize the inner city. So they took away the black man's ability to take care of his family. This was a prelude to the disintegration of the traditional black nuclear family. And so in the 1970s, they took away the jobs. They took away the factories. They also went into the high schools and took out all of the industrial building trade programs. So up until 1970, you didn't have to go to college to lead a successful life. You could go to trade school two years, become a plumber, carpenter electrician, manual jobs, manual jobs. Yeah. they paid the bills very comfortable. Yes. Our grandparents didn't need college, 
So they took all the industrial programs out and then they start telling all black children you have to go to college now yeah. to be a success. Yeah. That was nothing but an economic trap to put all black people into debt to the European bankers for the next 100 years. Yeah. They're doing it in Africa, they're doing it in Paris, they're doing it in the UK, they're doing it in America. Yeah. Okay, your investment in college rarely pays itself back mm -hmm. after you get done college. Now there are some exceptions to that, medicine, law, there's a certain few fields where your investment can be returned. But for 95% of African youth living in a European context, okay, uh, Western Europe or America, your college investment will not be worth the amount of money that you paid for it. So in the 1980s, that was when the CIA dropped crack cocaine off in the black community, chemical warfare, okay? In the 1990s, we get Bill Clinton's crime bill. So the crime bill began to in a matter, in a way we never saw before, began to send massive amounts of black men to prison with mandatory minimum sentences for nonviolent drug offenses. Up until Bill Clinton, there were no mandatory minimum sentences for nonviolent drug offenses. After Bill Clinton, there would be. Under Bill Clinton, okay, we saw what a five, six, seven hundred percent increase in the rate of black men going to jail. He also gave us three strikes and you're out. Three felonies and you could go to jail for the rest of your life. So then in Y2K, you get the presidency of George W. Bush. Mm -hmm. He came up with two things, No Child Left Behind and Faith-Based Initiative. With the Faith-Based Initiative, he found a way, although the Constitution forbids it, he found a way to funnel federal funds to black churches. The black church has always been the bulwark of the black struggle. Everything we've gotten, we've gotten it through the church. The Ku Klux Klan was fought through the church. We got out of slavery through the church. Uh, black uh, organization. Everything that we fought for came through the church. George W. Bush, with a very Machiavellian tactic with the faith-based initiative, FBI, basically turned the black pastor into the new black snitch on political movements. And so now the reason why you don't see black churches in America involved at the forefront in any of the major areas of struggle for black people, education, economics, mass incarceration, police genocide, you name it, they're nowhere to be found because they're being paid by the government to stay out of it. But now I'm getting back to, you know, 2009 when uh, Barack Obama was elected. Did the situation of black Americans improve under Obama? My next yep. step. I know, I know, I know. So from George W. Bush was Y2K. Mm -hmm. Barack Obama, 2008 ran, 2009 election, but I'm going to put him with the second decade, 2010. Okay. okay? Barack Obama, here we go, another weapon of mass destruction against black people. So the 70s, the de deindustrialization. The 80s, chemical warfare, crack cocaine. The 90s, mass incarceration. Y2K was the faith-based initiative. But along with Y2K came No Child Left Behind, mm -hmm. which would see to it that record numbers of black children in America would not get high school diplomas. Because under No Child Left Behind, even if your child is classified as learning disabled and they receive special ed service, they still have to take the same graduation tests that non-disabled children must take. So as a result of that, you have hundreds of thousands of black children who have spent 12 years in school who will not get a diploma because the special ed program did not prepare them for that. So once again, you have the proliferation of mass incarceration. 2010, Barack Obama, which was probably the most disastrous weapon of them all. Really? Because it's the only one where black people was led into believing that they would actually benefit from it. So with Barack Obama, you have tokenism, a black face out front, which is something America has always done, which is why I was so upset at my people for buying into something that they have always used against us. So with Barack Obama, Barack Obama was put in office for two reasons. One was domestic one was international. Every president of America is given a domestic mandate and an international mandate. Barack Obama's international mandate was to make Africa and its resources safe again for Western exploitation, in particular through the AFRICOM program of putting United States military bases within African soil geographically located close to places with high levels of mineral reserve. So what's going on in Ghana right now? An agreement between the Ghanaian government and the United States to put a military base in Ghana. This is all strategic to make sure that if Africa ever decides to rise up and push back against European imperialism, a.k.a. white supremacy, they will not be in a military position to be able to do that. 
So Obama succeeded. And the reason he succeeded in Africa is because Africa, just like black America, just like black Europe, thought the presidency of Barack Obama was a blessing because we don't understand white supremacy and we don't understand politics. It doesn't matter whose face is on the cover. It doesn't matter whose face is out front. The only thing that matters is the color of the hand that makes the decisions. Barack Obama was a flunky. He was a functionary. He was a stool pigeon and he was a puppet. And yes, he was a coon. Barack Obama did absolutely nothing to benefit Africa. He did absolutely nothing to benefit African people. Now, domestically, Barack Obama's job was to distract black people in America long enough for the government to take everything that our ancestors fought for, roll it up into one big ball, civil rights, voting rights, affirmative action, equality, you name it, and roll it on over to the feminist movement, roll it on over to the LBGT movement, and roll it on over to the multicultural movement. So today in America, whenever you hear civil rights discussed, Black people are not in the conversation. It's gays, it's feminism, or it's multiculturalism. They use Barack Obama to take everything black people fought for and give it to people who have never fought for black people. What do you know about the situation of black people in France? I'm somewhat familiar because I tend to study the international situation. Not thoroughly familiar, but I will say this. In all my travels, wherever I go, there's four things constant. I don't care if I'm in France, London. I don't care if I'm in South Africa, Nigeria. I don't care if I'm in Holland, Austria, Jamaica, Turks and Caicos, Canada, L.A., Houston. On the planet, there's four constants for African people. Number one, we're worshiping a white Jesus. I don't care where you go. Black people in love with a white Christ. That's number one. Number two, you have mass incarceration of black males at a rate four or five times their percentage of the population in that particular state. Number three. You have miseducation of black children. You have the over-identification of black children in classifications of mental retardation, ADHD, learning disabled. You have record numbers of single black mothers raising our children on their own, okay? And then on top of that, you also have a black economy which is totally dominated by people who do not look like us. I don't care where you go on the planet, Black people are not in control of their economy. Your rice, your bread, your milk, your sneakers, your hats, your clothing, your transportation, your electronics, everything you buy is being sold to you by somebody who don't look like you, but more importantly, don't care about you. What would be the solutions? Because, you know, this is a statement, but now what could be the solutions? Solutions are simple. And the solution hasn't changed as Marcus Garvey articulated it over 100 years again. Mm -hmm. And the solution is independence in all areas of human endeavor. The solution for African people is no different than the solution for Chinese people. The solution for African people is no different than the solution for the French people. It's the same. It's no secret. It's not hidden under a rock. We have to do what everyone else has done and has built ourselves up independently, economically, educationally, spiritually, socially, politically. We must become a power base, which we are not as we are today with all of our doctors, with all of our college educated folks, with all of our black capitalistic business owners who are only looking to get rich themselves but do nothing to raise the general economic condition of black people, we are still a race of dependence. If you live in France, you're dependent on the French government for this and for that. You're dependent on white business to provide your basic needs. America, it's the same thing. Africa, it's the same thing. Wherever we are, we are dependent on the white power structure where we live. There's four institutions that you must have in order to be considered an independent community. We don't have them nowhere in space and time at the same time. A hospital to protect African life. A supermarket, okay, for nutrition to preserve African life. Education to prepare the next generation of African children for the role that they must play in the freedom struggle. And number four, a bank to finance the building of infrastructure and institutions and organizations and programs where we live. You cannot find those four things totally owned by African people anywhere on the face of the earth, but we will call ourselves free. There's two types of freedom. There's a F-R-E-E-D-O-M and there's an F-R-E-E-D-U-M-B. 
White people have the freedom. We have the freedom because we're too politically uneducated to recognize that it doesn't matter if you can drive a Mercedes. It doesn't matter if you can live in a white suburb. It doesn't matter if your black child can go to a white school. At the end of the day, what do you control? What do you own? What do you produce? What do you distribute? Marcus Garvey said a race without power and authority is a race without respect. A race that doesn't respect itself automatically forfeits the respect of other people. So you say, where did we begin? Two things. Education and economics. Okay. It's going to be hard to break the psychological change of slavery as long as just about everyone in this room went to a white school to get their education, a white public school to get that education. And what is the function of public education? Whether it's UK, France, Austria, Germany, USA, it doesn't matter. The purpose of education for African children in a European context is to teach the African child that you are second place and that is where you will always stay. And the only way you can rise above it is if we give you permission to rise above it. The education system's job is to make sure black children never come to believe that they have a right to replace the white boy being in control. That was the next question I was going to ask you because you know when we speak about African Americans, do you think that African Americans are truly and deeply aware of their African roots? Well, I don't think that's a question just for African Americans. So I think that's a question for Africans anywhere. Yeah, of course, but I'm speaking about this because you are from, from the United States. So of course right, I'm but I, I want to pan-Africanize the question yeah. though. Okay, all right. So because so whether so you're funny. dealing with France, whether you're dealing with UK, whether you're dealing with black America, okay? So globally, yeah. Globally, yeah. it's no different. Yeah. Canada, it's yeah. no different. So do you think that Afro-descendants are really aware of their African roots? I think that we are aware of the roots, but we are in denial of the roots, okay? This is why black women spend billions of dollars on perm, weave, blonde hair, green eyes, blue eyes. This is why educated black men I don't care if they live in Paris. I don't care if they're in Austria, Holland, UK, Canada, US, or South Africa. Educated black men marry outside of their race more than the men of any other race put together because you hate yourself. And the reason, the reason why we do this is we actually think we can convince white people if we act white enough to accept us because we don't understand white supremacy and we don't understand eugenics. Eugenics is the science of exterminating the African DNA. It don't matter if you're light skinned with green eyes, you still African. It don't matter if you're blue, black, purple with nappy hair, you still African. It don't matter if you and parents in Paris speaking French or the US speaking English. At the end of the day, you carry the gene of Africa. And that gene of Africa is the most powerful DNA on earth. We are the only people who can reproduce ourselves in every other group. I can make a baby with a Chinese woman. It's an African baby. I can make a baby with a French woman. It's an African baby. An Arab, an East Indian, a Native American. It's an African baby. You understand? Yeah. The white man cannot reproduce himself in any other woman but one who looks like him because he's genetically recessive. I'm genetically dominant. And that's why he must eliminate me, because in the natural order of things, if I do absolutely nothing, we can literally predict the date where he will no longer exist. So he has to make a decision. He either has to get rid of me first before nature gets rid of him. So speaking about this, what is your feeling about interracial marriage? I don't support it. Why? I have nothing against white women or Chinese women or Arab women or East Indian women. But the black man belongs with the black woman. The first institution that has to be built is the black family. If you don't save that, you save nothing else. If you don't build that, you build nothing else. A white woman can understand my struggle. A Chinese woman can understand my struggle. And what black men fail to recognize, even when you marry white or Arab or Chinese or East Indian or Latino, that woman is still loyal to her race. 
So it doesn't matter she had your baby. It doesn't matter if y'all got married. It doesn't matter if y'all sleeping with each other. At the end of the day, her loyalty is not to her husband. It is to her community. And at any moment that that community calls on her to do a job, she will do it. So even though you're laying on top of her, she's still in charge of you. So what do you think about those black leaders who get married to what we like married? Like who? Frederick Douglass, for example, at the end of his Let's life, was, was married to a, a black lady. I think he was like 50 years old when he got married to a white lady. Much lazy. older than that. Okay, all right, okay. And I, think, I, know, I know it. So what, what is your feeling about this? Frederick Douglass yep. married that white woman when he was approximately 10 years from his death. Uh -huh. He was an old man. All right. And I don't have a problem with you bringing that up. It needs to be dealt with. Of course, yeah. But don't skip over the blue, black, chocolate wife of 50 years. See, my problem with y'all in the media, y'all give the white woman more credit than the black woman who held no, him I'm down. No, I'm just asking. I'm just asking. I'm clarifying. All right, yeah, go ahead. Y'all give him more credit than the black woman who hold him down. Y'all give him more credit than the black woman who helped him escape from slavery. Y'all give him more credit than the black woman that gave him five babies. He didn't have no babies with that white woman. He was an old man, and so was she. Was it right? No. Should he have done it? Absolutely not. And now as he looked back on it from heaven, I know he says to himself that I should have never made that mistake because the only thing that keeps Frederick Douglass from being undisputedly the greatest black leader on American soil now is just arguably the greatest black leader on American soil is because he married that white woman. He shouldn't have done it. Does that undo the good? Absolutely not. But it's a contradiction and it wasn't acceptable. But let's go a step further. Mm -hmm. Frederick Douglass's mother, my aunt Harriet was raped by Aaron Anthony, the white man who owned our family in Eastern Shore, Maryland. Being so-called biracial, I think that causes a little bit of confusion in Africans who are of mixed racial origin, which is another reason why we have to stop reproducing with non-African women. Not because those children are any less African than the rest of us. I consider a biracial brother or a biracial sister 100% African. But psychologically, it's hard for them to commit to the struggle when you have a parent who belongs to the race that is oppressing your people. So to eliminate the confusion, we have to stop mixing sun DNA with ice DNA. Neanderthals ain't got no business mixing with the original man. Here in France, some people question your credibility. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of it? Uh, first, are you aware of it? The are you aware of it? Because, you know, in, in fact, they're asking, so they're wondering if you're a real doctor. And second point, they're questioning your family bonds with Frederick Douglass. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we're not going into, you know, whole history, but are you aware of it? And what is your answer? A couple of individuals in my hometown of Philadelphia who I used to work with who know I have all the degrees and credentials because we worked in the same school. Do you understand me? Yeah, but because of jealousy and because their career never took off, many of them wanted to be what I am. They never got there. Yeah. So they began putting out false information about my credentials. Now, here's the irony about the credentials, mm -hmm. my doctorate degree. Anyone can call the university that I got it from okay. right now yeah. and find out if I got a degree. Okay. So there's no need for controversy when you can pick up a phone and validate the degree. Do you understand me? So I'm going to say nothing else on that because that can be verified immediately. Okay? As far, what, what was the other thing? That was the credential. Oh, Frederick Douglass. Let's deal with that. There's a coon within the extended Bailey family network who's ex-military and I think FBI who wanted to corner the Frederick Douglass quote-unquote market because he wanted to make money off the name of Frederick Douglass. Lectures, books, plays. Yep. So here comes Dr. Umar Johnson, a blood relative. My name is on the family tree. I don't make the family tree. I go to the family reunions. Everyone knows yep. that I'm a relative, okay? But I've never attempted to get paid off the name of Frederick Douglass. I've never been paid a penny to speak on Frederick Douglass. I've never made a penny off his name. Yep. I am who I am because I am who I am not because of who I'm related to. You understand? But this particular individual, he sees me as blocking his ability to corner the name of Frederick Douglass and exploit it for personal financial gains. Now, what they attempted to say was that I claim to be a descendant of Frederick Douglass. Show me where I've ever said that. I am a kinsman. That's on my autobiography. It's in my book, I Am a Kin. What exactly does that mean? That means Frederick Douglass, and you can read this in his narrative of the life, 
He grew up on Tuckahoe Creek with a cousin, Stephen. Okay. Cousin Stephen is my four-time great-grandfather. Stephen Henry Bailey, okay? I'm his four-times great-grandson. So Frederick Douglass becomes an uncle-slash-cousin because the two sisters, my grandmother Betsy and Frederick's mom Harriet, was raped by the slave master, okay? And of course, because they were sisters, then naturally the children are cousins. So Frederick and Stephen are a half-brother, first-cousin relationship, which makes Frederick Douglass to me a cousin as well as an uncle. Now, some people would still dispute whether the slave master was the dad. The proof I've seen is conclusive. But let's say they dispute that. Give them that argument. I'm still a kinsman because he was first cousin to my grandfather, and they grew up together, and he's the only cousin he mentions by name. Well, there's a few others, but he's the main cousin he mentions by name in his autobiographies. And all this is documented. Anybody can contact the family. See, that's another thing. I don't have to argue that. Pick up the phone. Contact the Belly family get and get your answer. So none of this has to be controversial because there's sources that can validate this beyond Dr. Umar Johnson. But put it to the side. If I had no doctorate, if I wasn't related to the greatest black leader in American history, I'm still the most significant school psychologist in American history. I'm still one of the most significant Pan-Africanists since Marcus Garvey. I'm still the most requested black scholar on the face of the earth, all seven continents. I've still done more to raise black consciousness on this planet than almost anybody you can name. So put that to the side. You still got to deal with me for what I've done, not for who I come from. Facts. Okay. All right. Speaking about Africa, what relations do you have with Africa? Oh, I have good relations with Africa. I normally do a tour in South Africa, 30 days, 30 nights. Mm -hmm every year. Didn't do it last year, but I'm looking at doing it in 2019. But I'm also working to open up my school, so that's going to depend. Where, in Africa or in the United States? Well, the first school is going to be in the United States, okay. because most of the donors are from the United okay. States. Okay. Right. But the second school will be on the continent. So you're planning, okay, all right. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, we do a group tour to Africa every summer, two weeks. Okay. This will be the fifth one consecutively. We're doing Egypt and Ethiopia. Okay. And that Pan-African tour, which I call FDMG, Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey, seeks to acquaint brothers and sisters from the West with their roots on the continent. Uh, let's see, I have relationships with Kenya, Malawi, South Africa, Senegal, Nigeria, uh, Ethiopia, Morocco, uh, Togo, Benin, just about everywhere. I keynoted a Pan-African conference in 2016 at the University of Kenyatta in Nairobi which was attended by African uh, organizing youth from about 45 different countries. It's probably the most significant lecture I gave because it was given to leaders in nearly every African country simultaneously in the same space and time. So I'm well known on the African soil. Uh, I speak in Africa on a regular basis. I have Angola coming up as a place that I'll be going to really soon and South Africa June 15th for National Youth Day. I should be speaking there as well. So. It's the second home. It's the first home and it's the second home. All right, okay. Thanks a lot. Take care of yourself. Thank you. All right? All right. All right, okay.